Over the past four weeks, I've been doing an experiment, seeing how a meat-only diet would affect my blood glucose, my triglycerides, my LDL cholesterol, ApoB to A1 ratio, and blood sugar-related biomarkers. Let's review the data. I think this is really interesting because many of you accuse me of being pre-diabetic, and I was so biased, I couldn't see how my meat diet, my meat-heavy diet was causing diabetes. So we're gonna review also a new biomarker that if, that is impacted by short-term changes in blood sugar-related parameters known as 1,5-AG, which stands for 1,5-anhydrous glucitol. And what's unique about this is this is a little bit more sensitive to short-term changes in blood glucose than hemoglobin A1C, as well as even glycated albumin and fructosamine, which we've reviewed before. Okay, so let's just share with you a screenshot of my lipid-related biomarkers after just a three-week, it's like three-and-a-half-week of a very low-carb carnivore-style diet. Now, the purpose of this was to see if I can go from a non-lean mass hyperresponder to a lean mass hyperresponder in just a three-week period of time. Uh, I didn't actually do that, and Nick Norwitz is going to be a little disappointed in this. I thought this was, was going to happen, and we were going to go from non-lean mass hyperresponder to a lean mass hyperresponder and back. Uh, in a short period of time, but I, I sort of missed the mark. So I'm going to, to uh, retest and go back on a, on a very low carb diet and uh, basically a carnivore style diet uh, shortly. But what's interesting is in just about a four week period of time, I actually did increase not that significantly, but if, if we just look at my lipid related biomarkers here, uh, my HDL uh, actually went slightly down, which is which is quite interesting. So you might be wondering, what did I? Ch how did I change my diet? Well, um, in the starting in August, uh, really July through October, I was eating a, a higher carb style diet, and those carbs were coming from seasonally available fruit, uh, as well as a lot of sourdough products. I got into sourdough bread making. My daughter started cross country, and we were making a lot of sourdough bread, sourdough pancakes, sourdough pizza, sourdough crackers. Like we went way over the top with that, and so I was having a lot more carbs than I normally do. And what was interesting is my blood triglycerides didn't reflect the, uh, I, I didn't become, I didn't start to manifest the symptomology, at least from a biomarker standpoint, of a, a normal high carb eaters. My blood triglycerides were 49 milligrams per deciliter. They actually went up a little bit doing this carnivore style diet experiment for just uh, three and a half weeks. They went up from 49 to 55 milligrams per deciliter. So they went up, but we're not talking about much, maybe like 2%. Now, my HDL cholesterol curiously actually went down a little bit, about six points. Not concerned about that, but my, uh, my LDL and my ApoB increased just slightly. So this was really actually quite interesting. We're going to talk about my glucose-related biomarkers and the glycomark, or the 1,5-HG, shortly. Um, my ApoB increased by just six points, which is nothing to brag home about, and my ApoA1 increased by just two points. So it was really interesting. I, I went from, again, moderately high-carb diet to virtually zero carbs and didn't see much of a change in that short period of time. So I think it's going to take longer for me uh, to see significant swings in my LDL and HDL cholesterol markers. So for all of you that say, well, if you eat a meat-heavy diet, you're going to cause atherosclerosis because your LDL is going to go up. You know, my LDL and VLDL didn't really change that much. My LDL did go up from 147 milligrams per deciliter to 151. So it went up by four points. Not that big of a deal, honestly. Now, what was interesting is my fasting insulin did drop by a full point. Not that I'm really that concerned about that. And my hemoglobin A1C dropped by one-tenth of a percent. So it went from 5.5 to 5.4. Now, we wouldn't expect significant shifts in my A1C over the court, that short time period. But before we talk about the 1,5 AG, and I, I would implore you to actually start measuring this yourself. I think this is, this is quite interesting. I'll explain the biomarker shortly, but in China, this is used a lot to look at um, changes in diabetes and blood sugar uh, biomarkers. But first, I just want to say thank you for being here. If you like these discussions, hit that like button. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Now, since we're talking about metabolic health, I do want to remind you about a tool that can help you indirectly support your metabolic health. This is a creatine paired with electrolytes. You know that skeletal muscle and having strength and performance is a really good independent way to support whole body health and longevity. One supplement that I strongly recommend you consider taking, especially if you don't eat a lot of red meat, is creatine. 
But one thing about creatine a lot, that a lot of people don't understand is electrolytes help creatine get into your skeletal muscle cells and into your brain. So that's why at Myosense, we have paired the creatine with electrolytes, featuring the Creapure creatine from Germany. Most creatine monohydrate on the market, as you may know, is derived from China. It's an impure material. It doesn't really taste all that good. So this unique electrolyte Creatine combination features the Creapure creatine monohydrate from Germany paired with real electrolytes that help not only support healthy hydration, but also sports performance. There's hundreds of reviews over at myoscience.com. You can check that out in the description below on the novel creatine enhanced electrolyte sticks. Two and a half grams of creatine paired with, with electrolytes as well as taurine, magnesium, potassium. It's a really great formulation that can help you intra-workout while you exercise and during and after your sauna sessions. You can save with the code podcast at checkout over at myoscience.com. So getting back to the blood work, let's talk about this glycomark known as 1,5-AG, which is 1,5-anhydroglucitol. Uh, this is a glucose analog. And it turns out, studies have shown that 1,5-AG reflects blood glucose changes in a one to two week period. Therefore, decreased levels of serum 1,5-AG can serve as a clinical indicator of short-term blood glucose disturbances and volatility. And so what we want is to minimize the glycemic variability. So the variability between your fasting glucose and post-meal glucose, we want to minimize that. And so what happens is when 1,5-AG goes down below 10, that is a marker that someone has a lot of peaks and troughs in their blood glucose variability. And so generally in people who have you know, normal, healthy metabolic health and don't have these massive swings in their glucose, the 1,5-AG will be anywhere from 10 to 20 micrograms per ml. So the range uh, here for healthy adults is uh, healthy adult males uh, is between 10.7 to 32. Mine, it turns out, is 10.9. So it's actually on the lower side, which is not necessarily healthy. And so I think this is quite interesting. I want to continue to tweak my diet and exercise uh, protocol to see you know, what is causing some of that variability. And this is something that, again, you know, for those of you that are seeking to optimize your health and your metabolic health and so forth, you might be able to figure out, well, what is causing the peaks and troughs? Uh, for me, I know when I go in the sauna, my glucose significantly goes up. When I exercise, it goes up. So not much research is known on 1,5-AG in athletes. It's mostly, mostly uh, been studied in diabetic individuals and people that have impaired fasting glucose tolerance and prediabetes. So this to me is quite interesting. I would implore, I, I'm very curious to see if you've been measuring your glucomark or the 1,5-AG and you're an athlete to see where your levels are at. That's quite interesting uh, to me. But in essence, the hemoglobin A1C reflects average glucose levels over the course of two to three months, while fructosamine and glycated albumin change over the course of two to three weeks. The 1,5-AG provides insights into blood glucose levels and postprandial hyperglycemia and glycemic variability over the course of a one to two week period. And this was actually approved in 2003 by the FDA under the Glycomark kit detecting serum 1,5-AG, establishing it as a new tool for short-term glucose monitoring. And it's been known to be a more commonly used uh, indicator for looking at diabetic screening. And, you know, it's interesting that this was approved in 2003, but I would imagine that 95% of you haven't even had a doctor mention this to you. This is how it takes so long for new things to be part of uh, mainstream medicine incorporated in, into the zeitgeist. So I think it's really important that we understand that this is a tool uh, that, that we can use to more fine tune our lifestyle interventions, our sleep management, our lifestyle stressors, uh, dietary supplements like berberine, for example, feeding fasting windows. There's a lot of things we can work on here. So uh, this is a tool that now is part of routine clinical practice in parts of Asia. And I think provided that about 93% of US adults have some degree of poor metabolic health, why don't we consider that as a tool here? So again, the 1,5-AG will start to decrease as you have more peaks and troughs in your blood glucose. And so uh, when it gets to be under 10, that suggests that you might have uh, too many ebbs and flows in your blood glucose uh, volatility, and that could be 
that could indicate that you're on the path of developing diabetes even before your fasting glucose changes, your hemoglobin A1C increases, your fasting insulin, and so forth. So a lot of you might be saying, see, your 1,5 AG is on the low side. That means that you're on the path of developing diabetes. And I would say, well, that could be. But it's also true that my fasting insulin is really on the low side. It was 3.1 micro units per ml. And going on a carnivore style diet for three and a half weeks actually dropped that by 25%. My fasting insulin before was four. So it dropped it pretty significantly. So um, that's interesting. I'm not, wasn't really concerned about diabetes per se, but I thought that was uh, quite fascinating to just understand there. Uh, again, for those of you that are concerned about the, the changes in lipids with a carnivore or low-carb diet, my LP little a is less than 8.4 uh, nanomoles per liter. Uh, sometimes that's in the 40s and 50s. That is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and, and so forth, as many of you know. So again, having a meat-heavy diet, that didn't impact my LP little a much, nor did it impact my ApoB to A1 ratio. We're looking at page two on the blood work here. So interesting stuff. Um, I guess Nick Norwitz might be a little bit disappointed to learn that I couldn't take myself from a non-lean mass hyperresponder to a lean mass hyperresponder in just three and a half weeks period of time. It's going to take probably, I'm going to give myself eight weeks uh, going forward uh, starting in December. So what are your thoughts, my friends? And if you do run your 1.5 AG, I would love to know what your glycomark number is in the comment section below. Please let me know. If you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. Thanks for tuning all the way in and we'll catch you on a future one down the road.